So I'd like to take the briefest of two sentence introductions uh, for Dean Levy, our 15th dean at the law school, or 14th, excuse me, I, I aged you one dean. Uh, it just seems like 15. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're incredibly excited to have him here today as well as all of you, so welcome to Carrots and Sticks. Thank you for that um, great introduction. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, no, really it was great, I asked for short. And, uh, you know, maybe the theme is sustainability. I think that introduction is sustainable. So, um, you know, it's great to be here, uh, and it's great to see all of you. I know many of you are very distinguished, and uh, I don't know you as well as I should, and I wish I knew you, but I want to I single out uh, two people. First of all, Kelly Brownell is here, the dean of the public policy school, the Sanford School, and Kelly comes from Yale, and he is an expert in food policy, and it's wonderful to have you here, Kelly. Welcome to the law school. Uh, we work very, very well together, and I'm very excited about what we can build together. And then uh, my wife Nancy is here. Nancy runs a cattle ranch in New Mexico, which raises grass-fed beef, and she's very important in the food movement in the Southwest, and so um, she's been very helpful to me in, in understanding some of these things, I know, uh, which I don't pretend to do. And I know I wasn't asked here because I'm an expert on food, although I am a consumer, uh, you may have noticed. Uh, first, congratulations to Delp and the students who pulled this together. Um, you know, this is your 25th anniversary volume, and that's a tremendous achievement. Who would have thought that something named Delp could um, actually become something really important and successful? And a lot of that tribute goes to Michelle Nolan. Where are you, Michelle? Because Michelle was the one of the people who started Delp. Uh, we need to talk about P's and F's and how they don't really go together, or maybe a part of it should be silent. But in, in any event, um, from what you know, might have been uh, very simple beginnings, now you have a, a track record and you have something to be extremely proud of. And this is an important journal at an important university for in the study of the environment and the study of food systems. I, I think w one thing that is notable about just the very fact that we have this conference here at Duke, really two points emerge. One is that Duke is a leader, thanks to people like Michelle. Um, those of you who are visiting don't know probably that across campus we have, a, we have a food course that is offered every other year or so, and it draws on all of the resources in the university, from the law school, from the public policy school, from the medical school, from philosophy, from anthropology, from, from everywhere, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's team taught because this university has so many people who are interested in this and understand that it, it, it requires an approach from multiple disciplines and that that can enrich the study. And, and the second point that emerges is that uh, the study of food and, and agricultural systems is something that is motivating uh, a new generation. And, you know, the, the law students who put this together are that new generation. And you can feel this around the country. Uh, there are many, many young people who did not grow up on the farm who are extremely concerned about what we're doing with our landscapes and with our food systems. So Duke, with its uh, traditional and uh, very uh, dedicated approach to interdisciplinary studies, is such a great place to study uh, this very topic because it interconnects so many of the disciplines. We have agriculture um, and all that, that that means, really the science of agriculture, the science of soils, uh, nutrition, medicine, uh, climate and environmental concerns, climate change. Uh, there's new work on food systems in the sense of delivery of food to uh, lower income people. It calls on our uh, ability to manage land, which itself is a something of a science or an art. And then, of course, it's all wrapped up in in this, what, the, what we do in this building, which is law, creating the right sanctions, the right regulations, understanding uh, the relationship between the public and the, and the private. And that's uh, something that I want to stress here this morning. So it might be said that agriculture is not adequately at the policy table and that in the future it, it, it needs to be because food and climate change are increasingly at the root of geopolitical 
unrest. And I suppose that we will see more and more of this as time goes on. The, the new work that is being done in, in medical schools and in science and, and nutrition is connecting all of these dots together so that we have a sense now that, um, and a greater understanding that the health of the land connects to human health. And in a very direct way, that the healthier the soils, the more diversity there is in the soil, um, the more and better off we are actually individually within our own within our own health systems, our own intestinal systems. And uh, the climate, climate change is probably the issue of our time, or at least one of, one of the issues of our time. And climate change and the health of the soils, it turns out, are very closely related. So biodiversity, which we talk about, um, I think we're now understanding that microbial bio, biodiversity in the soil transfers to microorganisms in the, in the human gut, and that that's through the food that we eat, and that's extremely important to health. And biodiversity on the land promotes uh, soil organic carbon accrual, and that's, of course, incredibly important for uh, climate change. I think we begin to understand that much of the Earth's surfaces, surface is in um, arid lands and in grasslands, and that the management of those grasslands is extremely important to the fixing of carbon. Uh, for every 1% increase in carbon that is stored, there's an additional 60,000 additional gallons of water that's held in those lands. Um, and so that improves the land and it improves the environment. There's a huge potential out there um, to do something about greenhouse gases and carbon storage if we have better understanding. But of course, most of those lands are in private hands, um, owned by individual people in a state like North Carolina, by a lot of people, and there'll be producers in here today, and that's very exciting. Uh, some of them come from the farmer's market, and, and we know them, and uh, it's great to have them be part of this discussion. And some of those lands are held by large corporate interests, and I think we're at an interesting period here where those, those interests are also under a lot of pressure. And if you go onto their websites, you'll see that they are um, accommodating to that pressure. They're extremely aware of the political and policy environment in which they operate. They're coming under pressure from climate advocates, from animal welfare interests, from health advocates, from consumers, uh, from the medical establishment, which is so concerned about obesity and antibiotic resistance. Uh, they're coming under pressure from environmentalists because of water and soil depletion. So there are a lot of uh, interests being born, being brought to bear here. And the question is, how are we, how are we going to work through this? Uh, will it require regulation? Will it require different kinds of incentives? And those are classic legal problems in the, in the public realm. So what a great uh, topic for interdisciplinary research. And you have, uh, looking through the program, you have just tremendous people here. Um, it, this is going to be one of the, it is already one of the signature areas for, for Duke, and it provides uh, a great platform for leadership, I think, from our students and our faculty and all of you who are here today. So we are very grateful to um, the visitors who are here, who are leaders in your field. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate that. It means a lot uh, to us and to our students. Uh, these are important issues, and I think to be a student in a law school like this and to be able to think about the most important legal and policy, science and medical issues of our time um, as you master your field, uh, that's a rare opportunity and a great one. Thank you, Delp, for doing this. Congratulations on your 25th birthday. Thank you all for having me here today. Thank you.
Hello, welcome. Thank you all so much for being here. Our first panel will be on U.S. food law and policy, and it will be moderated by Professor Lemos. Professor Lemos is a scholar of constitutional law, legal institutions, and procedure at Duke School of Law. Uh, she graduated from summa cum laude from New York University School of Law, and she was a law clerk for the U.S. Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. Her articles have been published in the Supreme Court Review, as well as in Harvard, NYU, Texas, Minnesota, Vanderbilt, and Notre Dame Law Reviews. Professor Schneider serves as the director of the LLM program in agricultural and food law at the University of Arkansas, Arkansas School of Law. She graduated from the University of Minnesota School of Law and got her LLM in Agricultural Law from the University of Arkansas School of Law. She is a past president of the American Agricultural Law Association, and she was the winner of the AALA Professional Scholarship Award in 2011. Professor Roberts is the founding executive director of the newly established Resnick Program for Food Law and Policy at UCLA School of Law. He earned his JD from the University of Utah and his LLM in Agricultural Law from the University of Arkansas School of Law. He is the former first chair of Lex Mundi International Agribusiness pa Practice Group, and he was also a visiting scholar and consultant to the UN Food and Agricultural Organization in Rome. Professor Roberts is now working on the first major treatise on food law titled Food Law in the United United States. Professor Fortin is the director of the Institute for Food Law and Regulations at Michigan State University College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Professor Fortin received his JD from MSU College of Law. After graduating, he managed the food service sanitation section of the Michigan Department of Agriculture before going into private practice where he concentrated on food and drug law. He published a textbook in 2009 titled Food Regulation, Law, Science, Policy, and Practice. Professor Morath is an associate professor at the University of Akron School of Law. Professor Morath, Morath received her Master's of Environmental Studies from Yale University and her JD from the University of Montana School of Law. She clerked on the U.S. District Court for the District of Maine. Of Maine. Professor Morath's articles have appeared in the Oregon Law Review, Seattle University School of Law Review, and the Public Land and Resources Law Review. Thank you. So thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, I, I am here on this panel more as student than expert, and so I don't want to take up um, any time. We have four wonderful panelists, so let me turn it right over to them. Um, so each panelist will speak for about 15 minutes, and then hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions. Professor Schneider. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me OK? Great. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend uh, Duke Law School and the students and faculty who worked to put this forum together. I think it's an incredibly important topic, and I'm extremely impressed with the people that you have assembled for the uh, session today, and I'm really honored to be here, so thank you. Carrots and sticks, moving the U.S. national food system toward a sustainable future. I'm going to be talking today about livestock production, and it's particularly ironic to be looking at the goal of moving toward a sustainable future. If I can take just a minute to uh, share a personal experience, I actually grew up on a dairy farm in Minnesota. And while I'm, I'm getting older, uh, it wasn't that long ago that we actually had a sustainable food system in terms of livestock production. And I remember it. Uh, we had diversified farms with a variety of crops being grown, a variety of livestock being grown. Um, a great deal of what's now termed rotational grazing, but at, at that point it was just the way that it was done. And so I, I find a certain amount of irony talking about this topic now of how 60 years later we're trying to discover how to develop a sustainable food system. Um, some of what we need to do uh, needs to look at undoing some of the uh, modernization and some of the, the improvements that we've done with the goal of producing more food, cheaper, and faster. So that's sort of my, my overall theme on it. Um, in light of that, I'd like to begin by mentioning a USDA report on changes to the livestock industry. And in quotes, they refer to it as a striking, a series of striking transformations that have occurred over the last 40, 50 years. Um, and I'd like to just emphasize five of those areas as a lead-in to what my topic will be, and that's pharmaceutical use in the livestock industry. Uh, first of all, we've seen a shift from diversification to specialization. 
So where on the farm I grew up with, we had a variety of farm animals at all stages of their, of their lives. Um, now we have specialization. Most farms produce one animal, and in fact, particularly in the hog industry, most of those farms produce one animal at one stage of its life. We have advanced breeding techniques that have eliminated most of the diversity in our major livestock um, categories. So we're not only specialized in terms of the farm level, but we're specialized in terms of the genetic um, constitution of our, our herds. Second, we've had a dramatic increase in the size of farms. Uh, while we've increased the number of animals produced. And I know a lot of this is, is information that all of you are aware of, and you're thinking, yeah, yeah, I know about that. But there's a risk, I think, in not emphasizing exactly how dramatic some of the numbers are and some of the changes have been. For example, in the last about 40, 50 years, we've doubled the number of animals produced. We now produce over 2 billion uh, livestock and poultry per year in the United States. And at the same time, we've reduced the number of farms by 80%. Another significant change is the shift from grazing and pasture-based agriculture to confinement agriculture. Making that from an environmental standpoint, which I'm, I'm going to be coming back to and really focusing on the environmental effects, um, we have regional concentration. Certainly you folks here in North Carolina know about regional concentration, uh, where the hog production in the United States, chicken production, and to a large extent even cattle production, and certainly dairy production, used to be dispersed around in a number of different regions. We now have regional centers where we have a tremendous number of animals concentrated in one region. The environmental effects of that are, are significant. And finally, uh, the, the feed that we feed our livestock now, not only is it no longer produced on the farm the way it was when I was a kid, um, it's also manufactured largely by industry that's involved in producing the animals, um, and it's manufactured specifically to enhance uh, growth promotion, uh, feed conversion ratios, and that's where it gets into my topic today of the pharmaceuticals that we put into the feed to increase the efficiency of production. Now, animal um, drugs in animal feed raise a lot of really interesting issues. And I've got about 15 minutes here, so I'm, I'm not going to get into uh, very many of them. I'm going to focus specifically on environmental issues. But I have to remember, or I, I would be very lax to not mention the animal welfare consequences, the food safety issues that are raised, the worker safety issues that are raised, and linking the environmental effects to the public health issues. Okay, what kind of drugs are we talking about here? Well, the one that's gotten the most press certainly has been antibiotics. Um, so we're going to talk just for a minute about uh, the widespread use of antibiotics, particularly at subtherapeutic levels in livestock agriculture. Another issue that doesn't get as much press but is certainly as significant in the industry is the use of um, uh, synthetic hormones, particularly in the cattle industry. Third, the pesticides. Uh, we feed a lot of our, our animals uh, a variety of pesticides to deal with um, uh, parasites, fungus infections, a number of other things. Four, the heavy metals that we feed livestock. Arsenic, zinc, and copper still maintain, are, are still maintained as considered to be advantageous drugs in the livestock industry. And fifth, uh, a, hot, a topic that you'll see in the news a little bit more and that's actually getting some interesting press thanks to a lawsuit that I'm going to be mentioning, uh, the beta agonists, ractopamine, Zilmax, some of these other drugs, which are designed specifically to shift the food metabolization that an animal has away from fat and toward muscle so that we can, in fact, produce leaner meat and at a faster rate. Okay, the, the three, the, the four issues really that, that surround this are number one, what drugs do we use? 
Are those drugs safe to be used? Second, the amount that we use them in. Third, and this is an, an issue that I've been sort of kicking around in my writing for the last few years, what happens biologically? Um, in an industrialized food system, one of the primary mistakes that I believe that we make is we consider animals to be like any other product that we um, produce in an industrial system. And what that misses is the biological connection. When you feed an animal something, something happens to that feed to convert it, goes through the digestive system, it ends up being excreted in the manure. It's not the same as painting a car on the assembly line at, at General Motors. And fourth, as I referenced, what drugs are excreted in the urine and manure? We produce over one billion tons of manure in this country per year. And the, the question comes up, what is in that manure? OK, antibiotics. There is no publicly available accurate data on exactly what antibiotics are being used in livestock production, how much they're being used, on what farms they're being used at. There's no reporting that's required. Most of our livestock is grown with what's called a proprietary feeding system, so that the uh, food processor that's providing to the feed to the farmer that's taking care of the animals or that has contracted with the grower to produce them um, has the recipe for that food, and it's very difficult to determine uh, what levels of drugs are being administered. We estimate, however, that there are about 30 million pounds of antibiotics sold per year, or 80% of the antibiotics that are produced go to livestock production. 80% of the antibiotics produced in the United States are being used generally for subtherapeutic use, and that's used below the level that you would give an animal if it was ill. And it's generally given in feed or in water. 55% of the antibiotic, of the categories of antibiotics that we use in livestock production are also antibiotics that are used in human, uh, for human uh, drug use. Now, what industries are affected in this? Well, again, we have so little reporting that it's difficult to determine, but EPA and USDA have estimated that about 70 to 80 percent of cattle receive antibiotics in production. 90 to 100 percent of cattle that are in feedlots receive um, antibiotics. 90 percent of dairy cows, when they're in their non-lactating period, receive some type of antibiotics. That's not when they're being milked. There are fairly strong regulations about uh, the use of, of antibiotics during the milk production time. But most cows during the non-lactating period, in fact, 90 percent, do receive antibiotics. 85 percent of piglets receive antibiotics, 89 percent of finisher hogs. And it's pervasive in the poultry industry. Very difficult to get accurate records of the exact percentages. But if anybody's interested in this, I direct your attention to a very interesting Reuters investigative report that came out uh, last September that was based on an analysis of feed tickets that they got. And I, I, it's a fascinating report. There's incredible data. It surprised everybody, including surprising a lot of people at FDA, at the amount of antibiotics that were used, and in some cases, the specific antibiotics that were being used. But I think it's, it's a sad um, indication of the state of regulation that we're relying upon Reuters to do an investigative report on feed tickets in order to find out what our main, one of our major food source uh, is being, um, it, how it's being raised. Now, why are we giving all these antibiotics um, to animals? The primary reason or the, the majority reason is for growth promotion and feed conversion ratios. That means you can grow an animal faster on antibiotics, and they require less food in order to achieve that growth. So it clearly presents an economic efficiency for the producer. The second reason which is really morphed into it is disease prevention. 
And again, I'd like to mention this is disease prevention. This is, we're not talking about treating actually um, sick animals at this point. Um, this from public health professionals uh, worldwide are concerned about the disease, the antibiotic resistance that this can contribute to. Um, and that's um, certainly one of the public health issues that's involved. The other issue that's involved from a, a wealth, animal welfare, or excuse me, from an environmental standpoint is that we have a lot of these antibiotics that are then released through the manure as well as the antibiotic resistant pathogens that are released in the manure and can provide contamination. Uh, next issue uh, is hormone and uh, the hormones in the livestock industry. Well, now animals like humans produce hormones naturally. Uh, many of the animals that we produce are in particularly uh, stressed and high productivity environments, and so they produce more hormones, particular more stress hormones, than they might normally. But we also have a system of administering synthetic steroids to animals. And uh, we see a lot of pharmaceutical use in this area as well. We've got four particular reasons why we do this. Stimulate growth, stimulate reproduction, stimulate milk production, and to affect muscle mass. How am I doing, how am I doing on time here? Four minutes, okay. Um, with cattle, we have ear implants and injections. Uh, that, that RBST is one of the, uh, the hormones that we're still using in the dairy industry. Again, there are no reporting requirements. We really do not know how pervasive the use is, except that we know it's, it's a lot. It's a majority of our production. EPA estimates that there are over 700,000 pounds of hormones excreted by livestock per year. Um, heavy metals, I just have to mention one of my favorites, uh, the use of arsenic, um, and I say, I say that uh, Obviously, a, a tongue-in-cheek. I did some work for a law review article in Wisconsin last year that talked about the tortured um, attempts at regulation through FDA. At the same time, uh, EPA was banning any use of arsenic as a pesticide in crop production. We had FDA allowing um, an organic uh, arsenic to be used particularly in poultry production, as a growth promotant. Well, now, what do you think happens when you feed it to chickens to promote growth? Well, it ends up in the chicken manure. Where does the chicken manure end up going? It's used as a fertilizer. Is it any surprise that we end up finding arsenic absorbed in our rice fields in my home state of Arkansas and in other, other areas where we've applied a lot of poultry litter. Now, it's o not the only reason why we have arsenic in rice. Uh, we certainly have a, a residue of arsenic in, uh, from its use as a pesticide. There is some um, arsenic that certainly occurs naturally. But the interesting biological issue about that particular issue is that the FDA assumed, well, it's just fine to give organic arsenic to chickens as a growth promotant because organic arsenic isn't as dangerous as inorganic. Well, lo and behold, it turns out that in a chicken's digestive system, there is a conversion factor that is involved in transferring organic arsenic into inorganic arsenic uh, which is then excreted in the chicken manure. So uh, a, a, a problem. Uh, one, of the, um, uh, one of the worst uh, arse arsenoids that is produced, aroxazone, has, is now no longer used in poultry production here in the United States. Okay, two minutes, one minute left? One minute left, okay. Um, I, I, I had meant, will mention just really quickly uh, ractopamine. Ractopamine is the um, uh, drug that is very much in the news now. 60 to 80 percent of uh, livestock uh, pork production and cattle, ractopamine is extremely important. And that gets me to where I want to conclude and to get back to your topic here. Well, how do we move toward a more sustainable system? The first way that we need to move for, toward a sustainable system is to have consumers and lawyers and policymakers recognize what we're doing. I, I emphasize no reporting 
uh, several times because we really need to get this issue out to the public and to the uh, let the public tell the industry that this is not the way that we want to move our meat production. Uh, one of the other ways that's related to that that comes back to ractopamine is through litigation to force the FDA to regulate uh, more st stringently. Right now you have regulation that is primarily dependent upon the information that the industry provides to the agency. If there's any environmental assessment whatsoever, and there frequently is not an environmental assessment of, with any uh, rigor, uh, is provided by the industry to the FDA. A suit that was filed that I'm uh, very, going to be very anxious to follow uh, last November was Humane Society of the United States uh, versus Margaret Hamburg. Uh, it's challenging the FDA specifically with regard to ractopamine and to some of the antibiotics that are administered along with ractopamine in a combination uh, administration. Their, one of their strongest arguments, I believe, is saying that they, we need to have a NEPA assessment before we are administering or before we're approving drugs like this. We need to assess what the environmental impact is, looking not just specifically at how this drug is going to interact with this particular uh, usage, but looking at the larger systemic question. Um, for example, when ractopamine was first approved, very, very um, uh, non-rigorous uh, ana uh, analysis of the environmental effects of it. Uh, but at that point, they emphasized relatively uh, small use in the hog industry. We're now at 60 to 80 percent of livestock are receiving ractopamine. And the environmental effects of that are something that we just haven't assessed. So please, uh, for a lot of information, please attend to my article. I'm looking forward to working with the, uh, the journal. I think it's a fascinating topic, and there is lots and lots of additional work that needs to be done in this area. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Roberts. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to echo uh, Susan's sentiments about uh, our appreciation for being here. I especially uh, applaud the interest of students in food law and policy. And uh, as I tell my students at UCLA, I don't expect uh, all of you to become food law lawyers, uh, but we certainly need a lot better food law citizens. And uh, th those of you who can figure out a way to incorporate Parts of food law into your practice, all the more power to you. And, and but, but we we really need people who are interested and, and um, knowledgeable about this topic because there's just a lot of rich issues uh, out there. Um, I was very uh, interested in Susan's presentation. We had a, a summer fellow from Michigan uh, last summer at UCLA actually write a paper on the tool of um, state in, uh, state law in addressing uh, the use of antibiotic drugs in farm animals. Uh, looking, uh, preemption is always an issue uh, when you deal with uh, legal tools, addressing uh, food law problems, and uh, uh, I think that's an interesting, um, an interesting topic for uh, another discussion. Um, the, uh, uh, I recall, uh, about a decade ago when I taught my first food law and policy class at the University of Arkansas with Susan's uh, support and interest, the night before I actually taught the course, I, I recall breaking out in a cold sweat uh, over uh, the, the possibility that a student might ask the question, what is food law and policy? <laughs> um, and I, I remember going into my office early that morning, and I, I pulled off the shelf a very old uh, agricultural law book written by Pedersen and Meyer, and I don't remember the third author, uh, that was no longer in use. And I was interested in their definition of agricultural law. And the definition I thought was very uh, was relevant to uh, a definition for food law and policy, which is uh, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Uh, and I think that still uh, sticks in my mind as the best definition of food law and policy. It truly is multidoctrinal. Uh, and there are, I've always said that you could take any law class that's taught in a law school and find a relevant food law topic 
whether it's constitutional law, whether it's uh, real estate law, whether it's uh, um, torts, uh, whether it's uh, administrative law, obviously uh, international law uh, issues are ripe with uh, food law issues and so on and so forth. One of the problems in such a uh, diverse field is that uh, we often uh, find ourselves compartmentalizing uh, food law and policy topics. Uh, and, it's, and, and that makes it, quite frankly, very difficult to find holistic solutions uh, that will ensure a more sustainable future for food that benefits both consumers and the environment. So in a, in a modest attempt to decompartmentalize, I think that's a word, uh, my, my presentation will explore connections between food fraud and sustainability for the purpose of finding practical legal and policy tools. Why? Well, I think, first, the connection is not obvious, and so it sort of proves the point of the need to, to look at these issues in a more holistic way. And secondly, I've been dealing with food fraud now for a number of years, and, and it's one of the most complicated, interesting issues that plague the global food system, let, not, uh, let alone the, the uh, food law or the food system we have here in the United States. It's also interesting that food fraud has, has really plagued food commerce for a long time, even back to the Roman Empire and the Greek civilization. Um, food fraud, in other words, the, the, the padding, the diluting, the substituting of food product um, has emerged as a real menace in the modern food system. Recent reports, recent news events, everything from the horse meat scandal in the UK that many of you probably heard about, to fox meat uh, in China, which was a a real embarrassment to Walmart, uh, to in this country from seafood uh, to olive oil to juices and to honey uh, underscore the uh, ubiquity of fraud in this modern food system. And the U.S. government, like all governments around the world, struggle in trying to find solutions to this uh, problem. Um, I, I should add that uh, Notwithstanding the fact that we take China to task, which, quite frankly, we should, given the problems in its food system, uh, a lot of problems which are imported into this country, uh, it's interesting that China lined up on the opposite side of the U.S. on the question of ractopamine mm -hmm. uh, in a vote that was put forward to the Codex Alimentarius Commission, which is a commission that sets standards for enforcement of food at the international level. Uh, there was a vote, and China is and Europe lined up on the opposite side in terms of approval. One of the reasons is because China, in China, that the human studies that were put forth by the U.S. to justify the use of ractopamine uh, did not take into account the consumption of the organs of animals, which in China they're consumed more frequently. And so the Chinese government had uh, concerns about uh, the, the human studies. But food fraud uh, is, is a big problem, uh, and it's, it's interesting. I, every time I teach uh, my class at use, uh, I've been doing this now for a number of years, uh, my food law and policy class, I have a, an olive oil tasting demonstration, and I call UC Davis, the Mondovi Center, which specializes in um, wine and, and olive oil, and they direct me. I always ask them the question, I want to have three olive oils, uh, for my demonstration to the students. And I want a, the really bad olive oil, a medium-grade olive oil, and a superior olive oil. And, uh, and the, the students then take a vote on which olive oil they think is the best. And I call the Mondovi Center up at UC Davis, and I say, what's the really bad olive oil? Well, anything you can find at Ralph's or any other <laughs> supermarket. Well, give me a, a, a title. Anything. doesn't really matter. So, of course, I pick out uh, uh, an olive oil that looks like it came from Italy. That's always the, uh, it's just awful uh, olive oil you can buy in most any grocery uh, shelf. And I get a medium-grade olive oil, which typically is a California uh, olive oil, which uh, seems to pass most tests. And then a superior olive oil, which you usually have to go to a specialty store to find. Last year, I found uh, olive oil that came in from Argentina that was exquisite. So we have this test, and not once have the students ever voted for the exquisite olive oils being the best olive oil. 
Uh, oh, it, it, most of the time, it's uh, it's the middle grade olive oil that gets the vote. Although several students often vote for the rancid, awful olive oil, which I still haven't figured out. Um, but it goes to show that we've we've really tasted ourselves out of what real food tastes like, uh, and it's it's an interesting exercise, and it it always sticks in the minds of the students. Uh, when they take the class, that they're dealing with a, a, an issue here that uh, affects their lives uh, personally. So we have this this problem w- with food fraud, and and I may I might add I, I know that students law students love to eat sushi. I know that's a, a big thing, and and especially in Westwood, I assume it may be here as well. Are there good sushi restaurants in town? Uh, but fish and sushi are rampant with with fraud. Uh, it, we import now over 80% of the fish that we consume in this country comes from Asia, and there's a lot of problems. In addition to fraud, the use of illegal antibiotics, quite frankly. Uh, and, and so the, the problems uh, are there. Uh, honey uh, usually does not um, uh, have pollen in it anymore uh, when you buy it off the grocery shelf. Um, so how do we deal with this problem? Well, we... My point is that we have a a framework. We do have a food and drug law framework that's been around for a long time, since 1906, and then 1938 with the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and then most recently with the Food Safety Modernization Act, heralded as the the most major piece of legislation since 1938. And quite frankly, it's ill-equipped to deal with a lot of these issues, in addition to antibiotics, but also food fraud. Uh, I have been to the FDA numerous times to talk to them about this issue. And we don't have enough time to get into the, into the nuances of the statutory and the regulatory framework. But essentially, historically, what's gone on is, is that the, the, the FDCA, or the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, uh, has included a range of actions that constitute what is considered economic adulteration, which is a form of food fraud, the major form of food fraud that consists of the padding, the diluting, and the substituting of food product. In addition to the making of standards, which quite frankly has fallen, uh, in addition to, to defining food fraud, there has been the, the making of standards under what's called Section 401 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. These are recipes. And historically, the FDA was all about making standards, identifying what real food was, falling out of favor. Why? Well, technology has made it very complicated. Uh, and we have a, the, uh, an, an interesting case where Vice President Al Gore, uh, when he was in, the office, in office, made a big deal out of the fact as to how much money it took the FDA to actually define what a can of green beans was. And so this was seen as a waste of government resources. Uh, it was embarrassing to the FDA, and as a consequence, they began to, to they, they stopped making standards. And even today, relatively few food standards uh, are made unless they're made at the state level, uh, especially with respect to honey and olive oil. Instead, the agency turned to labeling, uh, which is really sort of the second uh, piece to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. We focus on adulteration, which is primarily safety issues, and labeling as a method of, of enforcement against uh, food fraud. But it has been largely un- ineffective. The Food Safety Modernization Act is struggling on, on what to do with this uh, issue. It's, uh, uh, the, it seems that the, 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 the answer has been to use preventive controls as a tool uh, against food fraud, which has uh, its own limitations. Notwithstanding the fact that we, we can't really get into the details of how the, the, this framework falls short in addressing this problem, you'll just have to take my word for it. Uh, but it does, it does raise the question, uh, what, what is it that's missing? And the thought has occurred to me on more than one occasion that this struggle to identify food fraud as a priority and oftentimes what the FDA will tell you when you visit them about a fraud problem is show us a safety problem, then we'll address the issue. But we're not going to address it if it's just a fraud problem. Uh, we don't have the resources, the time, the energy, and, and it doesn't, there's not really a clear path regulatory-wise. Uh, but it has occurred to me that the struggle is, is in large measure uh, the inability to connect food fraud to larger values. 
uh, which would elevate the priority to address and enforce. And one such, one such large value is authenticity. Now, the value of food authenticity is that it promotes real food, honest labels, organic, local, eco-labeled food, and sustainability. Uh, by reducing the incidence of food fraud, consumer trust, for example, in a sustainable foods is strengthened. Authenticity also promotes the sustainable development of local uh, food production. It protects locality while transmitting and developing local food culture. Uh, food authenticity relies on and is connected to other values that are important to sustainability, such as traceability, transparency, and accountability. Again, my point is that this modern food regulatory system that we have is not equipped to deal with this kind of value. It's not expressed anywhere. It's not articulated anywhere other than the labeling regime that's, quite frankly, not, not sound enough to accommodate uh, this sort of value. But you think about it. Uh, the genetically modified food, for example, um, there was a proposition in California, Proposition 37, that fell. There's now one in, in Vermont uh, that passed uh, that now is a subject of a lot of litigation. And, and, and it's, it's difficult for those who want to ar argue for mandatory labeling on food product with respect to genetically modified or genetically engineered food product or ingredients because there's not a legal hook. There's not a legal hook in the, in the legal framework. And there's this, 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 this value of authenticity or transparency doesn't really transfer very well within that legal framework to the label itself. And we're also dealing with science. It's a science-based approach uh, to food. But this, but this value of authenticity doesn't always square well with science, does it? Uh, and it's a value that a lot of consumers hold uh, near and dear. But how can the food regulatory system incorporate authenticity as a value or as, as a tenet? And I don't really have a, a good answer for that question. Uh, certainly, um, uh, litigation could be an interesting tool. Um, there are other countries that are exploring this tenet, actually, um, namely Israel, uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Europe. Um, but it's certainly uh, a, an interesting sort of value suggestion as, when we look at food problems uh, in, in, a, in a decompartmentalized way and examining the values that we hold uh, for the food system and how, what meaning that it may have in various ways of looking at uh, food law and policy. So I urge you to uh, be careful when you purchase sushi uh, and when you buy olive oil and you buy honey and you buy juices and uh, eat well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Professor Fortin. We are all Europeans. We're all Asian. Of course, we're all Americans. And our food supply, we're all connected. We're, what we eat in America affects Europe and Asia, the rest of the world, and what they eat there affects us here. Even if you're not buying a global, uh, global food product, uh, what we eat uh, affects our systems and affects it globally. Um, I think a lot of people lament this, but rather than lament it, I look at it sort of like Pandora's box. Uh, globalization has been opened, and like Pandora's box, it's not something we're going to close again. And it brings us some good things and a lot of ills at the same time. And one of the um, reasons I say we're not going to put it back is we've had inter huge international food scandals. We've had uh, global economic downturn, we had local food movements, and none of this has even um, perceptibly slowed down the increase in globalization of our food supply. It's nearly $2 trillion uh, internationally now in, in agricultural trade. You know, it's, that's $2 million million. Um, and it creates um, some dilemmas. Um, some of the dilemmas are things that Michael talked about. Um, you have a million people working in the food industry around the world who are loosened from normal society norms and are hard to, to address with national laws. So you have increased, op incredibly increased opportunity for fraud and, and adulteration and misbranding of food. And 
The other thing that this creates too is that one of the, one of the reasons you're not going to see it put back in the box is because the food industry, the manufacturers, the distributors, the sellers are under intense pressure to cut costs. And this drives an increase looking to global sourcing, and which creates another a cycle of increased global uh, sourcing of, of ingredients and foods. So um, the, the free enterprise tools are very powerful. They're, and they're, they're driving essentially a cycle down to lowest cost. Um, and even the industry often hasn't, the food industry hasn't often been aware of how much this is happening um, and to, to their own detriment at times. And it's created also, it's created some externalities and it's created some problems with our foods, our global food system that's some fragility um, and some, in addition to the fraud problems and the safe, there's safety problems um, with doing this. I'll give you an example. If you want to make a product that's fortified with vitamin C, and you're a U.S. manufacturer, you cannot buy U.S. vitamin C. You have to buy it from one of the two foreign plants that make it. You create a system like this that relies on two plants in the world, you create a fragile, more fragile system. And you also, one of the reasons the costs are lower to, to go, go globally is because you externalize some of the costs um, of things like environmental laws, Things like regulatory law. Regulatory law, I, I, you know, I, I, I'll give you a bias. I'm in favor of food regulation. Um, I've been involved in food regulation for 30 years. Um, I, was in, I enforced the law. I wrote the Michigan law. Um, I am a big believer in the positive power of regulation. Um, lots of evidence that um, good regulation, stringent food safety standards, actually creates markets increased economic growth um, is a powerful, uh, important, long-term uh, factor in success of, of systems and markets. But we have a, a situation where the, the, you can escape the, the U.S. regulatory system, the, this friction and this cost of the U.S. regulatory system by outsourcing abroad. And that's another area where it creates a more fragile, a more risk-prone global um, marketplace. And I am compartmentalized. I'm not, you know, you're also externalizing labor laws and occupational safety laws and environmental laws, but I'm dealing with you know, food regulation. And one of the things that often is missed when everyone is talking so much about, and I agree 100%, we have to look glo globally, we have to look holistically, and we have to look across disciplines um, food law is essentially, you have to look, be cross-disciplinary with science and law. Um, so I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of that, but I'm also um, seeing that you can't start uh, breaking down the barriers um, across to get a holistic view until you get success at the individual areas. FDA recognized 30 years ago that some of these antibiotics in animal feed were unsafe 30 years ago, and they have the power under the statute to ban it. They haven't done it. We have a regulatory failure that is not going to be solved by any cross-disciplinary approach. You have, you have to get the agencies to be working the way the statutes are written and the way they're intended. Um, and we have to, now with a global situation, we have to look transnationally and how we're going to um, address these problems. And it's, it's addition to this quantitative problem, huge qualitative problems. It's, it's, it's impossible for us to expect FDA, even though Congress does expect it, expect FDA to go to China and Thailand and do all the inspections and make the food safe. It, you can't do it that way. But one of the things, one of the very positive things about Food Safety Modernization Act, and I actually think it's actually bigger than the 1938 Act. It's the largest change in U.S. food law and history. It's broader. The 1938 Act was very broad. The Food Safety Modernization Act is even broader. Um, it's much, much more detailed than the 1938 Act. It's the 1958 Food Additive Amendment was very detailed. This is even more detailed than the 1958 Amendment. So it's broad, it's detailed, and it gives some incredible tools to FDA 
um, going forward. And um, particularly, I'm going to deal with transnationally with the imports because it puts, it does put a preventative approach on importers. And it, if you think of it as Archimedes, you have to know where your, your fulcrum is and your levers are. And it puts the leverage on the importers. And this, this is because they have the greatest incentive to get the, the product, uh, reg, the food safety and the, and the fraud, for that, for that matter, um, taken care of. And they also have um, the greatest power to do it. Government's not going to do it. You have to somehow lever the, uh, leverage the industry to do it. And the importers are where the Food Safety Modernization Act puts it, that, that fulcrum and that lever. And many, there's many concerns about how this may offend the World Trade Organization, agree, our trade agreements. Um, I, I, I wish I had time to cover it. It won't offend our, our um, cytophana, cyto, phytosanitary agreement or our technical barriers to trade agreements, if it's Im implemented properly. You have to take my word for it, like, <laughs> like Michael's. But it, um, if, it, if it's implemented properly, because it's science-based and risk-based, if it's done right. And you have a situation where a lot of the people that are offended about the increased costs of importing into the U.S., I actually see it as finally sort of leveling the playing field where they have to come up to the regulatory standards that we already are meeting in the U.S. Um, so it, it's, try, it's starting to level out the, the playing field. It also gives FDA some tools um, beyond memorandums of understanding, things like mutual recognition. They, they've recognized New Zealand, for example, having equivalent food safety authorities and, and systems as we do. Um, so we can use New Zealand inspections and New Zealand work as FDA work. Um, Congress gave a, an incredibly um, outrageous goal for FDA to do an exponential increase for five years of their inspections. So it, um, it, the year before Food Safety Modernization Act passed, um, FDA had done 216 foreign inspections. And Congress said, first year, you want, we want you to do 600, so triple it. And then we want you to double it every year for five years, which is going <coughs> to end up being 19,200 inspections in uh, year 2016. It's totally unachievable with FDA inspectors. But the silver lining to that is they can use, they have the power to use the New Zealand inspections, who are, which are done on an equivalent system, an equal system as ours, to count as FDA inspections. There's no reason why we need to be duplicating these efforts. Um, and for that matter, there's no reason why a New Zealand inspection in South Africa couldn't count um, and be shared with FDA and count into what they're doing. And they're starting to share laboratory data on um, analyses. And mostly what I'm talking about is, is food safety. They don't do a, a whole lot with food fraud and if it's just economic adulteration. But, um, but you, have to come up, you have to come up with a solution that solves this intractable problem of lack of resources. Um, and so the, again, leveraging the industry, but also having to find a way to, to break down um, the national barriers and have some type of transnational cooperation. We have to invest more in, in Codex Alimentarius. We have to think strategically transnationally to achieve things that we've that have never achieved before. Um, I, I love Paul Collier's proposal that we put a use tax internationally. We put a use tax on international fisheries uh, and then fund uh, international uh, food programs. We need to think strategically to solve this, this, this problem of, of, of resources. If you come up with a solution that doesn't do that, um, it, it won't work. Uh, many, many great solutions that have failed because of, of nobody uh, identifying a resource. The, um, I started with the um, metaphor with Pandora's box. And one of the th things that um, about the mythology was that it was began with the giving of fire to mankind. And if you think of fire ma metaphorically as our technology and our globalization, um, there's benefits with that. But there's also the, all the ills that came out with Pandora's box. But the last thing that came out was hope. And I really see an opportunity that we could have a, a, a future transnational approach to food safety regulation um, like it's never been seen before. And I think, we, I think we have to have successes 
in these individual silos. Um, and the successes in international environmental law end up spilling over into help, helping us get successes in food regulation. And I think food regulation successes spill over into um, helping us get successes in other areas too. So I think um, we have to think across the silos, but we also have to realize we have to get the fundamentals down first um, because we're not going to achieve um, going forward uh, beyond the silos unless we can get those fundamentals. Otherwise, we'll just create a paper um, system that doesn't, doesn't work anywhere. Um, I'll, and I'll leave it there. I, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Morath. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to be talking about uh, another piece of legislation, the Farm Bill, and argue that a sustainable food system, which is the topic of the uh, uh, symposium, requires a Farm Bill that takes a holistic approach, that appreciates integration and coordination, and that embraces principles of system thinking. And so the outline of my paper in this presentation will include a brief overview of the Farm Bill um, and why I think the Farm Bill can be labeled what's called a wicked problem. And then I'm going to um, talk about system thinking and how system thinking can be used to address wicked problems. And then finally, I'm going to conclude by just focusing on a few programs within the most recent Farm Bill that employ system thinking. And I sort of point out that I think this is somewhat unintentional. I don't think there's an overt um, interest at the federal level to engage in system thinking. But I think that because the Farm Bill is uh, re uh, reauthorized every five years or so, that policymakers, advocates, and citizens have the opportunity to adopt a system thinking mindset when crafting future Farm Bills. So as many of you know, the Farm Bill arose from a confluence of economic and environmental disasters in the 1930s. And so the overreaching goal of the original Farm Bill, um, I'm, I'm, I'm being very, um, I'm generalizing greatly here, but was to stabilize commodity crop prices. And our commodity crops are the wheat and the rice and the corn. And so the federal government set, stepped in to assist farmers and the result was this uh, federal subsidization of commodity crops, something that hasn't changed significantly um, in the past 15 farm bills. And um, a lot of authors and scholars have argued that this um, subsidization of commodity crops and industrial farming has contributed to a variety of the ills that we've sort of heard about today already. Um, but Mary Jane Angelo, who's going to be speaking in just a little bit in her article in 2010, Corn, Carbon, and Conservation, noted that over time, significant changes have been made, numerous programs have been added, and the breadth of issues covered in the Farm Bill has expanded to encompass emerging agricultural interests such as conservation, organic production, and bioenergy. So that brings us uh, she's probably writing about all of the farm bills up to the 2008 farm bill in her article. That brings us to the 2014 farm bill. And in his presidential signing statement, uh, President Obama remarked that the 2014 farm bill was like a jackknife. And you all know what a jackknife is, hopefully, right? Um, and he sort of echoed uh, Tom Vilsack, who is the secretary of the USDA, his, his phrase that the farm bill is a jobs bill, an innovation bill, an infrastructure bill, and a research bill, and a conservation bill. So we have a single piece of legislation doing a lot of things. Um, interestingly, the reviews from advocates, scholars, and commentators, uh, the reaction about the 2014 Farm Bill was somewhat mixed. We have the American Farmland Trust praising the new bill, calling it the biggest reform in agricultural policy in years. And then we have Michael Pollan and Mark Bittman and Marion Nestle calling this sort of a business-as-usual Farm Bill. But I do believe, despite these mixed reviews, the overall consensus was that um, it could have been a lot worse. So <laughs> I saw that in several places. It could have been a lot worse. So um, 
a, a wicked problem. What is a wicked problem? Why was passing the farm bill, I sort of deleted how long it took to pass the farm bill, but it took a long time. Um, why was it such a challenge? And why do many feel that this, our most recent version of the farm bill falls short? And simply put, the farm bill and um, cr creating a sustainable food system in general is a wicked problem. And the term wicked problem is most frequently associated with the social scientists Riddle and Weber to describe a problem that is exceedingly complex, that involves a number of stakeholders, often with conflicting interests, and for which the solution will generate waves of consequences over a period of time. And since their publication in 1973, and they were focusing on planning and, and um, urban development, the term wicked problem has been applied to a number of social, environmental, and public policy issues, including AIDS, national security, health care, education, and climate change. And many of you might be familiar with Richard Lazarus' article from 2009, where he calls climate change a super wicked problem. And I'm saying that I think, uh, you know, creating a sustainable food system is a super, well, maybe not a super wicked problem, but it's a wicked problem. Um, wicked problems reflect profound differences in societal priorities and values, and solutions to one problem often create others. One way to think about a wicked problem is to think about problems that are resistant to unilateral solution. As explained in the book, Wicked Environmental Problems, in a wicked problem, Key stakeholders, including the agencies and various interest groups, typically have significantly different and often incompatible worldviews. Yet these profound differences are rarely explored or acknowledged. Thus, a missing dimension in the decision process is an effort to explicitly identify and consider the range of values that inform participants' perceptions of the problem and their preferred policy responses. So, um, in addressing a wicked problem, system thinking and system theory has, has been offered as a solution. And modern system theory gets its um, genesis from the biologist Ludwig von Bertenflee, who looked at principles of organization within a natural system. So we're coming from the science realm, but system thinking is now being thought of beyond just looking at how a biological or an ecological system functions. System thinking is now thought of as a paradigm that considers not only how we view or perceive a problem, but how we think about the problem. At its core, system thinking is a sense-making process that organizes the messiness of the world into concepts and components that allow us to understand things a bit better. I think I should tell my children, you know, employ system thinking when you're cleaning your room, right? You know, let's make organization of this mess. Um, but system thinking is also sort of forest thinking. It's rising above the functional silos, something that you mentioned having these silos, um, and viewing syst the systems of relationship that link the component parts. Uh, stated another way, the system thinking approach goes beyond the input, black box, output paradigm to one that considers inputs and outputs, intermediate, initial intermediate and eventual outcomes, feedback, processes, and flows. And um, Donella Meadows, who is a pioneer of system thinking, defines a system as an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized around a way that achieves something. So it makes sense that when we think, when we um, talk about our food supply and our food production, we use the term system to um, describe what it is that's actually being uh, accomplished. So despite all of these different sort of descriptions and, and definitions of systems and system thinking, there are common themes, and those themes include holism, integration, interconnectedness, organization, perspective taking, and nonlinearity. And the terms that I focus on in my paper and that I'll address today are interrelationships, perspectives, and boundaries. So when I was doing my research, I was trying to locate um, articles and uh, discussions on sort of linking food systems with this idea of system thinking. And there's a little bit of research out there at the local level. So I found a couple of articles talking about using system thinking to create food hubs or using system thinking to develop a, food, a local food policy council. 
I even found a class called Agricultural System Thinking that's offered at the University of Massachusetts by an agroecology professor. And so in agricultural system thinking class, you would discover the root causes of the uh, our agricultural system. You would learn how to build resilience into food and farming systems. You would see how linear thinking creates problems, and ultimately how to manage complex systems for multiple objectives, economic, environmental, and social, and thus move towards a more sustainable and successful, uh, truly successful agriculture system. Um, and so these articles and these classes are relatively new, but I think that this is just the start of a larger discussion of how, if we see it at the local system, perhaps we can, at the local level, perhaps we can start talking about system thinking at the regional level, and then even more broadly at the national level. So that... Um, brings me to the farm bill. And so I want to point out a couple of places where I think system thinking is being employed. Again, I, can't, I couldn't find anything that said, let's use system thinking when we create the farm bill or when we draft provisions for the farm bill. Um, but I do think that there are new programs within the farm bill that are exciting and encouraging because they suggest that um, policymakers and decision makers and advocates are sort of thinking beyond the compartmentalization of their issue and seeing how how um, a solution for one might affect um, a or might be a helpful solution for another group or party that's involved in our food system. So the first concept I want to address is interrelationships or point out where we see interrelationships within the farm bill. Interrelationships involves looking at things, how things are connected and, and sort of the consequences of these connections. And I think we see interrelationships with programs, and then I also think we see interrelationships between agencies to implement these programs. So one example is the Food Insecurity Nutrition Initiative Program, which is a new program that's part of the nutrition title within the 2014 Farm Bill. And what this program is is an incentive grant um, program for projects that incentivize supplemental nutrition assistance programs, or SNAP participants, to buy fruits and vegetables. So it's a one-to-one -one program where for every dollar that's spent on food and vegetables, the participant receives another dollar so that they can use that additional dollar to purchase more fruits and vegetables. And a variety of retail establishments can participate in this program, um, including farmers markets. And so it's another way to connect consumers to their farmers. It's another way to um, encourage um, healthy and, and offer healthy alternatives for those who are on supplemental nutrition um, assistant programs. And it's also a way to support uh, local farmers. So a single program that's achieving a, a multiple um, goals there. Another sort of linking or interconnected program is um, one that recouples conservation compliance to crop insurance. So this is something that was in the Farm Bill um, like 20 years ago, but uh, was discontinued and was reauthorized in the 2014 Farm Bill. And so farmers who want to grow their crops on highly erodible lands have to come up with a conservation plan first. And so, and they file this conservation plan. Um, linking insurance, so the protection that a farmer is going to receive with conservation is another example of good system thinking. This provision recognizes that farmers should not just be producers, but should be good stewards of the earth. Conservation compliance programs of the, um, the 2014 Farm Bill recognize that healthy soil is, part of, is an essential part of our food system, but also acknowledges that f farming is a risky business and that farmers often need protection. And then my final sort of example of interconnectedness is an agency initiative called the Health Food Financing Initiative that's a partnership between the USDA, the Treasury Department, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So again, sort of not thinking within a silo, but think thinking sort of between these agencies. Um, and this is a program where there are grants that are provided to grocery stores and farmer markets to locate in lower income urban and rural areas. So it is in incentivizing or encouraging um, retail establishments to 
locate in underserved areas, thereby improving access to healthy foods in some of these areas, so-called uh, food desert areas. Okay, so that's a bunch of, or a few examples of interconnectedness that we see in the Farm Bill. The other uh, two concepts, perspectives and boundaries. Perspectives, I'm just going to touch on briefly. Um, that is thinking about how you can see a situation in, in different ways. Um, and how we sort of view a situation can affect how we understand the system. And so when we think about perspectives, we are, in a way, thinking about alternatives. And so in this section, I talk about alternative types of farming. And we see in the Farm Bill historic funding level for those who are or farm organically and those who farm specialty crops, which are our fruits and our vegetables. Those are not new programs. So there were already provisions within the Farm Bill that supported those types of farming practices. But what we see is, like I mentioned before, it's this historic funding level. It's really um, taking it to sort of a new level. And finally, I'll just touch on boundaries. So when we think about thinking systematically, um, we need to be thinking about what's going to be in our system and what we're going to uh, not include in our system. So we need to be cognizant of the boundaries of the system. And there are a couple of uh, little illustrations that I think show how this Farm Bill is, is thinking about the entire food system um, and being more cognizant of what we're going to treat as being part of the system and what we're going to exclude. So the first example is the expanded definition of what a retail food store is. And so I see this as, as sort of excluding certain establishments from being authorized as a retail food store. Um, and so what this changes is a change to the stocking requirements of these retail stores. So new stocking requirements would require stores um, to, if they want to offer SNAP or accept SNAP, uh, they need to carry increased uh, amounts of fruits, perishables, so fruits and vegetables. So in order to receive SNAP, um, or accept SNAP, the certain retail stores need to uh, increase their offerings. So I think that this was sort of applauded as a change by anti-hunger advocates, creating additional opportunities for um, those who need to, to purchase healthy food. There's also, this is not necessarily tied to the definition of a retail food store, but CSAs, you're probably all familiar with CSAs now, um, can accept stamp benefits. So it's really just sort of thinking differently about where um, food supplies can come from and who we're going to think include in, in the farm bill within our food system. Um, there is support for gleaners. You probably know what a gleaner is, the person who sort of, I'm the gleaner at my dinner table. I eat all the scraps off my kids' <laughs> plates. Um, but community food projects now support gleaning projects. So there's not necessarily... Um, you don't find the word glean or gleaner in the farm bill, but uh, community food projects which are funded through the farm bill can support, they're, they're allowed to support gleaning projects. Similarly, um, the inclusion of physical activity or programs as part of um, nutritional educational programming is something that's new. So that, I think, again, is another illustration of how we're not just thinking about um, what it is that people are eating, but we want to offer opportunities for folks to um, exercise and when we think about the whole, the whole food system. And then the final sort of addition is the inclusion of the term food system within the Farm Bill. So this you do find within the Farm Bill if you do a, a text search. And I sort of liken this to the inclusion of local or the definition of local in the 2008 Farm Bill. So the, for the first time, we actually see the frayed food system within the Farm Bill. And it's only a few in a few places, but I think that that's an encouraging first step that we actually are thinking about our, um, our food supply in a systematic way. And so I just want to conclude by saying um, Michael Pollan notes that um, he, the, the 
perhaps the farm bill is, is a misnomer and it should be called a food bill. And I would argue that in order to create a more sustainable food system, the, this piece of legislation should be called a food system bill, um, one that not only recognizes food or farm within the food system, but also considers energy inputs, waste outputs, the urban and rural stakeholders, the producers, the consumers, and everyone in between. I think I'll just end there. Thank you. So thanks very much to all of our panelists. We have about 22 minutes for questions, um, which is terrific. Um, I, I have so many myself, but let me just ask a quick one to get us, <coughs> hopefully quick, to get us started. So several of you emphasized the interconnectedness of all of the problems that, that Food Law is interested in, and that, is, of course, is what makes them wicked. Um, and so as I was listening to you, I, I found myself thinking over and over again about the various institutions we have in place that might deal with this and how siloed our institutions seem to be. And so, and, and so trying to think through which of our institutions, if we're thinking about Congress, the executive, individual agencies, courts, states, localities, might be best suited to deal with aspects of problems that are so st systemic in nature. And so... I'd like to invite you to, to talk a bit about the problem or the, the possibility that Professor Robert <coughs> raised um, of, of state action. And, and Sarah, you talked as well about local action. Um, is there reason to think that pushing some of this policy down to the state and local level might be beneficial? Or would that be exactly the wrong thing to do, given the systemic and, and even global nature of the problem? A comment on that, I'll, if you don't mind me starting. Um, it's yes and no. Um, sometimes, yes, you can, you can do things locally and at the state, and it becomes a driver towards um, changing everything nationally. I think you can see that with nutrition labeling with uh, restaurant menus. Um, it, you get to a certain critical point with um, local and state governments uh, doing things that it ends up having to be done at the national level because of the urgency for uniformity. On the other hand, one of the things that really surprised me is with the GMO labeling initiatives, many of, in fact, <coughs> every advocate I've, of that that I've talked with was shocked that this was driving national preemption. And I, I think almost the inevitable consequence of, if you get a couple states having um, GMO mandatory labeling, you're going to have national preemption of the states um, at, some, at some bill before Congress. We do have a bill before Congress. Um, and there's a real risk. So you have to be careful about what, you may get what you want, but it may not end up, the outcome may not be what you want. So you could end up with um, a national bill that preempts the states from doing the labeling. Um, so it, it works. It, it, is a good, it is a good laboratory, but um, you may be careful what you ask for. It's the, uh, the law of unintended consequences, I suppose. Um, in addition to menu labeling, trans fat uh, was also, um, regulation against trans fat was also started at the local level. I, I think, and I agree with, uh, with uh, Neil, I think that the, the, the one point that I would make is that there really isn't any other choice. <laughs> at the federal level, you just do not have an agency that's able and willing to take on a lot of these issues. I mean, it's just not going to happen. If we're going to wait for the FDA to deal with a number of these issues, uh, we're going to wait for a long, long, long time. And so the answer is we don't really have another choice. And so I think uh, at the state level and even at a more local level, uh, for example, um, you know, the, the now infamous portion control uh, attempts at New York City. Um, in fact, uh, Kim Kessler, who now works for us at UCLA, was Mayor Bloomberg's food commissioner and uh, was instrumental in, in that effort at New York City. But that's an, an illustration of, of the activity that's taking place, not just at a state level, but also at a, at a uh, local level, and I, at a municipal level. And I think that's where the action really is and it needs to be. Um, and so my answer to your question is unequivocally yes, notwithstanding the, the, unattended, the problem of unintended consequences, because it needs to be, it has to be. I, I have to 
give an example. I, I agree wholeheartedly, and I, I appreciate your comment um, so much because it's so true. And one of the trans fats <coughs> a great example where um, I just actually just published an article. Um, trans fat has been an illegal food additive. Synthetic trans fat has been an illegal food additive for over a decade um, under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. FDA just acted with a proposal to recognize that it's an illegal food additive. Um, you know, 10 years later. And so it's, um, here, here is something that's killing people. And that's what it has to amount to. You have to have, it, the crisis has to get to the point where people are dying prematurely um, on a, a, a certain number before you're going to get FDA to act. It's not just mild health and safety issues. It has to be a big health and safety issue. And, and you can, like you said, economic issues get sweeped away. One of the things that's happening, too, is, you know, and it comes back to the, what do you call the farm bill, you know, you put the funding of FDA in ag subcommittee, you know, and you, F, USDA has 80% of the food safety budget and has 20% of the food product. FDA has 80% of the food product in the U.S. and has 20% of the food safety budget. Um, it, you know, it's, it's things are, a lot of things are topsy-turvy. FDA, a lot of congressmen have, um, Congress, uh, will um, go out and they'll say they, you know, they 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 in wrote, they they voted for the Food Safety Modernization Act to improve food safety. And then behind uh, everyone's back, they cut the funding for FDA because they know that if you starve the agency, um, you can do the same thing as you, know, you can pass the law, but if they can't do the law, um, if you starve them um, and. I, I keep expecting the pendulum to swim back, swing back, but we were, we're definitely in a, a, at least a decade, and, and bipartisan, uh, to a certain extent, anti-regulatory um, mood that um, is starving the agencies, and they're, they're not doing what the law has, uh, what Congress has directed them to do. Can, can I just, just, just weigh in on one level, actually even below the local regulation level, um, in the consumers are actually driving the market through their preferences that are being expressed to industry. And so you actually see more things happening because people don't want to buy that stuff anymore. And so the, the Tysons and the Cargills and the big players in the world are actually changing some of their products. Um, China has actually caused us, we're now producing ractopamine free pork mm -hmm. for China. Yeah. Um, so we can do it if there's consumer pressure sometimes uh, to back up the regulation. Um, on that question of state rules, um, just thinking about the problems with antibiotics and uh, the use of synthetic hormones in uh, uh, livestock production, you know, aside from the FDA uh, in regulating those, there is an environmental connection, um, and that's through the perhaps the Clean Water Act. And thinking about, you know, states are delegated to create their own set of water quality standards. Might that be an avenue for addressing the problem in somewhat of a roundabout way? If you could get a state to adopt water quality standards for the presence of antibiotics or hormones in a uh, effluent discharge or as an ambient water quality standard, might that be a way to kind of back up the chain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's an, it's an excellent point, and it's something that we need to be looking at. Uh, we've gotten so mired in controversy involving just the basic regulation and manure standards under the Clean Water Act that I'm a, I'm a little overwhelmed at how we're going to move forward even with the scientific data, but I think you're exactly right that that's, that's where we need to go. And I would just add sort of on a separate note that um, two of the programs that I mentioned are, are, are modeled on very successful state programs. So the incentive grant, the one for one, is a program that's in Michigan, the double up buck. So I think that federal um, agencies have a lot to learn from what's going on at the state level and, and even the local level. Thanks so much. There's a lot of really good stuff to ask about. But the one question I want to focus on is the role of the consumer. In, in a lot of this because it seems to me that when you think about how efficiency, profitability, and control of food commodities has become an obsession uh, amongst industry, how do you get consumers uh, to advocate for a better system of, of 
food production when we are obsessed with cheapness of price because farmers are getting squeezed and they know they can't do the right thing when they're being squeezed economically like they are. And so how do you get consumers to want to pay more for food or how do you change uh, our food assistance programs at the governmental level so that it's not just rich people who are doing this but we've got government support going uh, to putting more money into the hands of farmers so they can raise beef in a way that doesn't rely on all of these uh, additives to spur growth. I mean, is there a, a legal mechanism to be used to help consumers value the price of food more and pay more for it? Great question. I wish I had an answer. I think I, what I've seen is there's a tipping point where um, when you get enough consumers um, wanting something and then some then a company becomes successful in it in it other companies may copy it and but there's a tipping point and it's it's incredibly difficult to get it started and I don't really have a legal answer um, but I you know one of the things that I buy is I don't like I, I won't buy chicken that's been put in a water vat uh, I won't buy it and there, there are companies now that are selling air chilled chickens um, so but the, how do you get you know you really that's why it's a wicked problem too it's like you have to you have to somehow um, get consumer awareness. You have, have having the public pay attention, and you almost have to have the media paying attention at the same time. And then the farmers have to be ready. The producers have to be ready to at the moment. You sort of have to be patient and wait for the right moment then, and kick off the products and and uh, get it going. But once, often once they get going, they can be so, you know, sustaining and increase. But it's getting it started. It's hard. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's it's an excellent question, um, and it, it calls for, first of all, I think the, the issue with regulation, what the failure of our agencies to, do, to regulate in this area really is making an uneven playing field for those producers that want to do, whether it's hormone-free or antibiotic-free or humane-raised, because you're making it cheaper to raise food with a lot of, of these additions that, that most people, I think, don't want. So I think you have to have the regulation in order to have a floor and even playing field. But then you have to have the transparency so that we know actually what's happening in our food system so people are able to make those choices. I mean, at this point, I don't think most people are really aware of the food system and, and some of the, the problems, at least, that I see in the food system. So we need the transparency. And that, that comes from some of the secrecy. In, in the food system right now, that if we can just sort of lift up the lift up the sheets on on what we're doing, there's some of it that makes sense and it's very efficient, and there's other things that you really just have to step back and think, what in the world are we thinking? Transparency and a level playing field. Well, yes, but they're not they're not really organized in a way that, that sort of meets your point. I mean, there are there are parts of it. You know, uh, everything from the distribution of SNAP benefits uh, to um, the encouragement of local food sources like farmers markets and CSAs and so forth. But I think, you know, in a more broader way, your question sort of brings up, again, concepts that we sometimes silo. For example, food security. Food security is a, is a, is a concept that is predicated upon whether we're able to deliver good, wholesome, nutritious food for everyone. And that also brings up food, what I like to call food equity or food justice. But it's, I mean, one of the foundation points to this systemic problem we have is that we do have a cheap food policy that's been with us for a long, long time. And, and that in itself has defined in large measure everything from the farm bill to, to the way we think about food culturally in this country. Um, and for those of you that travel, you know very well that, that people shop differently in other countries. Uh, we have been a country that tends to load up a shopping cart. We go to the store once a week or once a month and load it up with everything we can find that's inexpensive, and we go home and we consume it. That's been the history of, sh of, of consumption driven by consumers, at least in retail stores. It's changing somewhat, but one of the problems is it's changing amongst those who are affluent. 
and not those who, who don't have um, the income to live that kind of lifestyle. Not everyone can shop at Whole Foods uh, or high-end stores. And even farmers' markets are expensive, expensive, notwithstanding the attempts to extend SNAP benefits or food stamps to those for, for purchases at farmers' markets. It's interesting, um, during the, the, um, the issue of uh, the GMO uh, uh, food or uh, mandatory labeling. But one of the arguments that the food industry does make is that the we that these mandates for state law uh, for genetically modified food will raise the price of food, and so that's it's interesting to see how that argument uh, resonates with consumers and voters. But I think um, that's a it's a that's a systemic problem uh, when we talk about cheap food policy and how it shapes our food policy. So in answer to your question, I think we see a lot of chipping away at it, but not in a, in a uniform, sort of national, thoughtful way. One of, one of the areas, the other area to chip away that I think is under-discussed is um, our land-grant universities and our cooperative extension in this country. I mean, it, I, I come from you know, Michigan State University, which is the first land-grant. I mean, it's Abraham Lincoln era, and it's created a great system of agriculture in our country. Um, it's been dwindling for 20 years, the support for uh, cooperative extension and for research. And most, you know, frankly, most of the research goes towards larger farming methods. And larger companies have the resources to do their own research. But um, you, you really, to ha for small and local operations, um, some of these don't have anyone that can do the research for them. And de they don't have the cooperative extension education anymore how to do different methods like they used to have even 10 years ago. Um, so I think part of the, the solution to the problem is that we have to advocate politically for support for the small farms and the, and the, the uh, holistic methods and, and um, specialty crops and things at, at, at a congressional level that to be supported with education and with research um, that, isn't, that isn't happening. Because one, one of the biggest disadvantages isn't so much the regulatory system. It's the, scale, the, the advantage of scale that the big companies have. Because you can, you can level the regulatory field, but the scale is still going to kill a lot of these smaller operations. Would you even take, for example, the Food Safety Modernization Act, which was just passed and heralded as rightfully so as a major piece of legislation, the, the, what were the concerns about through what is, with its passage? The primary objectors to the passage of the Food Modernization Act were advocates of small farms uh, because the cost of having a, a, food, a safe food supply system requires cost at the, at the farm level. And those who grow fruits and vegetables were very well aware of the, of the cost of compliance with this act. And so it's, it's when we look at these issues, we have to remember the cost to the small producer, and, and that certainly plays into this as well. Uh, the regulations can be very effective, but at what cost? Not only to consumers, but to producers as well. I, I was involved back uh, in the early 90s in, when the seafood HACCP was put into law, and we had a very um, you know, excellent sea grant and land grant initiative to provide low cost and no cost Ha seafood HACCP training all across the country with uh, hundreds of, of, of certified instructors. And I was involved in the, the train the trainer and the materials uh, developing that. That whole system is gone um, from 1991 till, uh, you know, till today. So th that's one of, the, you know, one of the, the concerns that Michael raised is, you know, how are we going to be trained to do this new HARPSI uh, in, in the Food Safety Modernization Act? Well, you're going to have to hire somebody. You're going to ha you better have an association or a group that can do it at low cost for you because the land grant system doesn't exist to do the cooperative education system doesn't exist anymore to do that and and it's the passing has just been lost. I mean, I don't. I, I'm amazed that nobody's advocating for it uh, like they should be. But do we have time for one more question? I'm getting a head shake. Okay, <laughs> with, with um, enthusiastic thanks to our <coughs> panelists. That's it. We're going to have a brief break uh, before we start the second panel, so feel free to do so the rest of your answers to the call. Questions. <laughs> <laughs>
talk about systemic approach too. I mean, yeah. when you